what's happening guys this is nathan welcome back to the brookie bub channel hey uh we're just traveling down the road here uh we're going to be uh, hooking up with uh, my buddy glenn nelson glenn nelson is the uh, coordinator for the west virginia dep sos sos stands for save our stream uh so uh what he does is uh he collects these micro vertebrates and uh, we'll learn all about that today uh so stay tuned uh, we're going to do some fishing also, so it's going to be a cool episode. So uh, we'll catch you out there on the water. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, we're just here uh, on Powell Creek uh, in Nicholas County. Hey, uh, we're just uh, going back there catching some bugs. Uh, so we're gonna get some identifications on these stuff and uh, let you guys know. Hey, everybody. My name is Glenn Nelson. I work for the West Virginia DEP as Save Our Streams coordinator. But today, I'm gonna take my hat out, and uh, Nathan Justice and I are gonna go fishing today. But before, we wanted to really make sure that we can make streams make sense and so with that is a lot of people a lot of trout fisher folks want to know what the fish are hitting on and so with that so here we are on this beautiful creek today um, went ahead and got our net full of bugs you know what are the trout eating and so in my world I want to know if streams are healthy or not and I want to know that because we're all connected to clean water and so I know um, I can go out here and look for this trout bait, but it's more than trout bait, it's more than fish bait. It's a connectivity to whether or not our streams are healthy. And so if I could ask you one question in this world, it would be, what are your EPTs? And so those EPTs stand for Ephemeroptera, Flakeoptera, and Trichoptera. And so what that really means, translated, stoneflies, mayflies, and caddisflies. And so those are our most sensitive creatures. You can use this protocol throughout the states. Um, it's used both professionally and it's used personally to try to figure out what might fish hit on, what might they be seeing in that water column. In my world, it's telling me more than that. It's telling me, are my streams healthy? Is that water healthy? And so we know whether or not our streams are healthy by gathering these benthic macroinvertebrates. Um, the benthic part means they live on the bottom. The macro means that we can see them with our naked eye. Um, without any kind of magnification or whatnot. And the vertebrate just simply means that they're um, without a backbone. More importantly, and in our world, as concerned citizens, concerned sports folks, concerned fly fishermen or women, um, we're in here because we want to find these bugs because we know whether or not they're sensitive to pollution or whether or not they're tolerant to pollution. And obviously, if you're sound for clean water, we want to find those sensitive bugs because it's those sensitive bugs that are telling us that our water is good. And so typically the bugs as juveniles live in the water for about two years until that magical hatch for all the dry, or dry fisher folks. Um, it's all about matching that hatch. And so it's the bugs, find one, wrong one. It's the bugs that live in there as juveniles this happens to be a big old stonefly, golden or common stonefly. The reason I know it's a stonefly is because if you look, you can see the gills underneath, right there in between each of the legs. People typically teach tails. I promise you I don't teach tails because tails fall off and so it's really about the gills. Their name, Placoptero, translates to folded wings and so this is a juvenile. When it's time for it to become an adult, it's going to actually make a slit down its back Hopefully it'll find a nice dry rock or stick to where it can soak up the sun and it's going to become that adult and so for two years they live under the water. Um, they tell us so much about the water. If you're finding two year old juveniles, it's telling you, especially sensitive ones, it's telling you that the water quality has been good um, for that two year period. If you're missing those, it's going to tell you something about, about your water and so further testing obviously. 
Um, so dry fly fishing people, you know, it's the biggest thing in their world is to, to figure out what these look like as adults. And so obviously it translates to figuring out what you're going to see, what the fish you're going to see target on, um, and then figuring out what life stage you're going to look at. And so that nymph that I was holding earlier obviously is going to be that wet fly that you're going to fish down in the water column. Hopefully you're going to mimic it looking like it's coming off a rock. Um, this lodge and that fish is going to key in on that. Um, as that juvenile becomes ready to become an adult, it's going to climb out of the stream. It's going to find that warm sunny spot as said and it's going to take a totally different transformation and that's where their names come in. Stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, craneflies, dragonflies. It's telling you that even though they're aquatic, they have this terrestrial period of their life and unfortunately for them Many are short-lived, some 24 hours, some four or five days, some two months. And so it's all about securing that generation, the next generation, um, both in securing the species, but both is that connectivity that I think a lot of people miss. Um, the connectivity of life, the things that, you know, these brook trout depend on them. Um, I hate to say it, but otters, osprey, we're all connected to this very thing that oftentimes we step on and don't even think about. And so the very fact that I've got this net full of bugs in front of me is all about, is our water good here? Can I brook trout fish here? Can I expect to see any fish here? Or do I not want to be in here? And so a lack of bugs, as much as they might be nasty and ooey and gooey, really finding these bugs um, really tells you that it's a healthy stream. So I've got more. And I certainly want to share. These are what your bugs eat. I mean, I hear where you got to tie certain flies and match the hatch, and, but these are all nymphs and these are all stone flies. I'm missing one. It's a roach like stone fly, but these are your giant stone flies, the darker ones. This is your common stone fly. Pretty big stuff, but think about it if you're going to be a trout, if you're going to be a fish. This is definitely going to be more substantial food-wise um, than smaller things. And it doesn't mean they don't pee on smaller things, I promise you. There's so many different bugs in this water column, but it's just good to know. And so obviously one of the most sensitive species we could hope to find in these stoneflies um, is telling me right off the get-go that our water is awesome. Um, we should go fish. We should be able to enjoy this. We should be able to let our kids swim in here because of these bugs. Um, another one, and it's not going to be near as cool because it was just crawling inside here. It's not pet stick, I promise you, for those that aren't familiar. This is known as a case building caddis fly. And so if I actually let it in my hand here, this caddis fly has got a really soft body. And if that soft body was allowed to be outside in the open, it's an easy target. And so this bug on its level has actually created a silk to make this case possible. And so it's actually glued together pieces of, in this particular one, pieces of sticks and pine needles. And so you can see it like slowly crawling in my hand with the water. So that bugs in there, obviously underwater, the case is a lot more buoyant. And so it mimics a normal drift. It's gonna follow detritus, um, organic debris, and a fish isn't gonna key on something like that. And so I always like to tell people, um, there's a lady who used to live in West Virginia, she doesn't any longer, figured out that she could take that caddis fly and put it in the fish tank and give it different things to make the case. Um, gold and silver and turquoise. And so it's cool to acknowledge that that particular bug keyed in, it just wants to make a case. And so it's actually keyed in on making whatever it's got available, um, very opportunistic. And so when they fly away, they don't need that case any longer. Um, when they leave that case behind, they actually, she gathers it and makes really cool jewelry. So I like to make sure I throw props to that. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here. One in particular I want to find, it might be too small. So what you have here are, or is, two different forms and so, for those fly fishermen who uh, want to fish the, the notorious greedy weedy, you're really mimicking a lot of things beyond the chartreuse bait 
um, the chartreuse signal of that's just a predatory bait. You've got this Rhytophidae, and so it's known as a free-living caddisfly. Um, like your stoneflies, like your mayflies, like your caddisflies, it's the most sensitive species that you'll deal with. And so the reason that I have a particular bug here, this one, is this is the cocoon phase, and so this bug is not far from becoming an adult. Um, this is the only type of caddisfly um, that is a free-living caddisfly. The rest of them are going to be net spinning um, or the case building that I just showed you. So, you know, your stoneflies are the most sensitive. Mayflies, right there, arguably equally as sensitive, if not more. And then your caddisflies, but they've got a window. Um, this being the most sensitive, your net spinning being least sensitive. And right in the middle is that case building caddisfly that I showed you. So the word benthic and insects, you sit there and think about it and you're like, there are other benthics that are just not really notorious. And so I have to show you this one. Everybody knows a crayfish or a crawdad. But this one particularly is uh, definitely bait. Um, you can see it's been eaten well if you look at it really good. But I mean, how could a brookie not snatch that up? How could a fish not snatch that up? Um, so obviously this little creature wants to get bigger as soon as, fast, or as, soon as possible. But you can see that as a fly fisher, you know, it's not always flies. Um, I know we fish with streamers, I know we fish with heck crawdads, cicadas or, cicadas or whatever, but you gotta think benthic sometimes, and that's where the whole nymphing procedure comes in, is because this is what these fish see time in and time out. All right, well, this is a really cool insect as well. This is known as a flat-headed mayfly. You can see that pattern. Typically, mayflies have those three tails, um, when I teach, I don't teach tails. Like I said, tails fall off. It's really, and if you can see that, you can see the gills moving on this individual. Stoneflies can't move their gills, and so you can see them a lot of times if they're in need of oxygen, doing push-ups or swaying back and forth. And that allows them to take up that oxygen. Um, whereas mayflies are actively going to move their gills, um, as this one's definitely showing you right here. And so you've seen the most sensitive creatures that I deal with in my job, you know, as I said, it's all about water quality. It's all about telling you, is your water safe? Um, is it fishable? Is it clean, cold? I mean, there's so many different things to really touch on. And, you know, it really comes down to, we can do chemistry, we can test for pH. Uh, we know the pH of the stream usually runs about 7, 7, 5, sometimes 8. So it's got an alkaline connectivity. Um, we also know that because of the groundwater influence of this particular stream that it runs normal as seen even when we've had substantial rain. I marked two and a half inches of rain in my house, which is only an hour away. All my creeks are flooded, can't fish them. This one runs perfect. Um, at least in my position, I'm super ready to fish this place. Um, the other thing is I know where the water quality is. So with that is we can do chemistry all day long every day not certainly not knocking chemistry but we can miss things in chemistry and so enter the benthics we're finding healthy population we're finding two-year-olds finding a mix of species not just one like i could say it's all about those epts um it's not all about them as much as i love them and that's what i fish with it's about finding a bunch of different species it's that huge um collectiveness of abundance and so it's about abundance it's about diversity it's about finding those sensitive creatures and it's about relating that back to what we're getting ready to do go fish Look at that healthy fish. Oh, that's a nice one.
I mean, you want to see where those crawdads and big giant stoneflies come from. <laughs> right there in her gut. Maybe I can even learn how to hold this thing. Here she comes. Look at that belly. Got her? Yeah. Thank you, girl. Get out of here. Oh. Ready? Yeah, go for it. So when I'm talking about matching the hatch, um, not necessarily what I mean. Um, I'm kind of more matching the hatch with that thing, the fly that I call the retriever tied out of my lab. But you know what? Different strokes for different folks. You can see they've got the red line. You know, that's really to emphasize the bleeding of the spinner versus the white line here. You know, that's more clear water stuff. And so emphasize that, uh, that bait fish. And you wonder why they didn't catch anything. Well, I think that's pretty prominent. I did. <laughs> hey guys, uh, the yellow sallies are starting to pop out, so uh, I'm gonna switch over to a uh, stimulator. Uh, see what that one does for me. So, uh, we'll see what it does. Nice fish, pretty. Got it? You wanna say something pretty about that thing? This is a shame. Such a nice stream to have. This much trash scattered along the banks. Ah, you see chasing after I did. <laughs> oh man, I love this.
man. <laughs> Gosh. I hope you're good, dude. We, I'm good, man. <laughs>